Well, y'all, I think we've already had church, man. Uh, God is good. I don't know what you brought into the space today, but man, if you're new, welcome. Uh, guys up to some good stuff. And so I'm gonna jump in here in a moment. I, I wanna do this. We're gonna be in uh, some different passages, but mainly Revelation chapter 19. So if you have a Bible or you wanna look that up, Revelation chapter 19, it'll also be up on the screen for us uh, here in a few minutes too if, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, so no worries. But let me, uh, let me do this. Let me just pray and thank God before we jump in, all right? God, you are good. And man, it's just, uh, it's so good to celebrate new life uh, in you through the baptisms and then the story uh, that was told, just, just how you're changing and transforming lives. And so today, uh, we just ask that you continue to do that, that you would, through your word, through your scriptures, your, your inspired holy word, Father, that you would just speak to us like a, a father would speak to a son or a daughter. And so we, we praise you for what you're going to do and what you've called us to. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're finishing up our series titled Dinner with Jesus today. So if you've been with us, man, this has been such a, a fun series for us just to get into the life of Jesus. And what I love about this series is if you haven't yet, at some point, hopefully uh, along the way, you'll be able to go back or put yourself, even today, put yourself as someone seated at the table. That's really been the goal is to read these stories, these moments where Jesus had dinner with people and then to insert ourselves in a way in which we go, man, what would this look like for me? What would, what would Jesus speak to me in this moment? And so one of the things I love about uh, dinner is, man, when you, can, when you can smell it, I mean, waiting is hard, right? Wait, maybe some of you are still waking up. Maybe we just need to like waft like an apple pie through the room. But you know, waiting for, uh, I've got so many, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. You know why? Food. Food. I mean, and you don't have to give gifts. You, you do need to be thankful, but you could just eat and put on your sweats and watch football. I mean, what's better, right, than a good meal? I remember the first time I went to Lambert's. Uh, Rachel and I, we had, we had married just uh, uh, maybe a year or two, and some friends invite us to Lambert's, and I'm like, oh, this will be, be great. And we show up, and it was an hour and 45-minute wait. And you can smell all the food on the other side of the, of the wall. Right? And you're standing there with people and you're looking at like weird things like things that, you know, a, a chicken quote or whatever on the walls. And you know, you're trying to figure out which bathroom is guys and girls because they don't put that. They just put like weird animals. And so you're trying to figure all this out while you're sitting an hour and 45 minutes to, to, to eat fried okra and have somebody chuck a roll at you. And it was the best meal I ever had, right? I mean, the, the waiting was so worth it. And here's, here's what I wanna talk about today as we jump into Revelation chapter 19. This is the, the, the final moment that we're gonna talk about in this Dinner with Jesus series. And the final moment indicates what we are waiting for now for a supper that's gonna take place. It's called the, the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. So I wanna, I wanna do this as we jump in. Waiting for something good is hard, you know that, but Revelation 19 gives us a peek into the other side of the door, the other side of the wall, what's on the other side of the waiting room, and this is what we read in chapter 19, verse seven. Let us be glad and rejoice and honor him for the time has come for the wedding banquet of the lamb and his bride has prepared herself. So today's gonna be an exciting message, an encouraging message for those who claim Christ because we're gonna talk about what this looks like. The passage we're talking about talks about the day when the wait is over. The day when the wait is over. The final dinner is being served and it's a banquet that's being put on by Jesus. So this is good stuff. In short, it's the moment that you are welcomed into eternity, into your heavenly home. And there are a lot of different views about what eternity might look like. And I think one of the things that I'm, I've been most excited about today in preparation for our time together in God's word is there's just a lot of different views about heaven. Those who don't believe in God are often proponents of this idea that we're made up of, of our brains and our souls are kind of this figment of our imagination. In fact, maybe you've even wrestled with that. This is called physicalism, right? And it's, it's actually not that common throughout history. And I say that because almost every 
Culture throughout history has believed that we are dualists, that we have a soul and a body. And in our culture right now, there is this movement to undermine anything that has to do with, 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 with a spiritual connection, certainly Christianity. What we know is that throughout history, this has not been the case. In fact, Lee Strobel wrote a book called The Case for Heaven. And in this book, he includes dualist thinkers, people who believe that we were made up of soul and body, like um, uh, folks like Augustine and Aquinas and Descartes and Locke and Kant, as well as scientists like Newton and Galileo. They were all dualists. So it's sometimes good in our context in the West to wrestle with this in light of a movement that says, oh, all this is a bunch of rubbish. Historically, the idea that we don't have a soul is unintellectual. And we're taught through scripture that we are in fact made up of body and spirit. So when we read about what happens after our physical bodies give out and death becomes reality, what we're able to grab onto in our faith is what often happens to our spirit. And the, di the dinner described in Revelation 19 happens at the return of Jesus. So what we read about in, in Revelation 19 hasn't happened yet. And when the lives as we know will end and eternity begins, it's probably important for us in the waiting room to know what we're waiting for, right? I mean, what is heaven? What, 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 what's it gonna be like? What is it we're waiting for? Most of us don't know, so it makes living this life incredibly hard because we don't know what's on the other side of the waiting room. So as we dig into this today, I wanna do this. I wanna paint a biblical picture of heaven from the scriptures we read today, all right? Now, there's a lot of different thoughts about life after death. Depending on what major world religion you would get into, Hindus believe in karma, and they believe that the next life means you return in a different body to pursue your next stage of destiny through reincarnation, right? That's, that's a Hindu belief. Muslims, they hold to works. If you're good enough, you will enter heaven. They believe if you die a martyr, you will enter heaven immediately. Orthodox Jews, they base the, 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 that our body will be raised to life on whether or not you are righteous enough or not. Buddhists generally hold to this view that that. Our, our bodies, what we know, even our souls, will be formless. We will disappear into this formless beyond. They, they, they often hold this view of annihilation. And this is general views, right? Because we're not studying world religions today. But all major world religions have variations of kind of these mainline beliefs. So what about Christianity? Like, what do we believe about heaven? What is it that Scripture teaches us? Uh, John F. Kennedy's niece, Maria Shriver, who's married to Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, that's just, just a great, uh, you know, way to be referenced, right? My husband's Arnold, you know. Uh, she, she wrote a book called what, what is Heaven? And it was written as a children's book and sums up how most of us in the Western world view heaven. So she wrote this children's book, and, and I just want to read an, kind of this excerpt for you, and I want you to hear this because this is how most of us would view heaven. She states in her book, heaven is somewhere you believe in. It's a beautiful place where you can sit on soft clouds and talk to other people who are there, and at night you can sit next to the stars, which are the brightest of anywhere in the universe. If you're good throughout your life, then you get to go to heaven. And when your life is finished here on earth, God sends angels down to take you up to heaven to be with him. And she goes on to talk about her grandma who's in heaven and says, most important, she taught me to believe in myself. And she's in a safe place with the stars, God, and the angels. She's watching over us from up there. The problem with Shriver's book is that this is not really at all what scripture or Christianity teaches. And yet many of us have this similar view. That at some level, I'm just gonna be floating in the clouds and most of us are, are certainly curious about what that's like and we actually get an unbelievable picture in scripture of this. When we read of the supper of the lamb, what do we know about death and heaven from scripture? That's all that matters, right, is scripture, not our opinions. Well, let's do this. Let's start with checking out 2 Corinthians 5. Here's what we know. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, 
an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So this earthly tent it's talking about is actually the world, not your body. It's the world. So we know that if this earthly tent, the world we lived in is destroyed, we have this building from God, it says. Meanwhile, we groan. I'm gonna highlight that. I feel like the older I get, the more I groan, you know? But we groan, and it's not just talking about, you know, getting out of bed with, with achy knees. It says, we groan, groan longing to be clothed and said with our heavenly dwelling. In other words, there's this tension in us as uh, some people would say, that, that we were made for something greater than just this world. It says in verse three, because when we are clothed, we'll not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, this world, we groan, and here it is, and we are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by what is life. So we get this incredible picture, I'll highlight that too, this incredible picture of what human beings, what humanity feels right now. So if you came into this space this morning and you're like, man, I'm carrying some burdens, guess what? God knows. He knows. He knows what you're wrestling with right now. He knows the weight that you're experiencing. Verse five says, now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. Says this, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come? That's big. He's saying, you can be sure of this. Those who claim Christ, who have submitted their life to Christ, has the spirit of God in them, guaranteeing what's to come. You don't have to question it. Verse six, therefore, we're always confident. If you're not confident, this today's gonna be good because it's gonna build your confidence. And know that as long as we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say. He says it again, right? We're confident. And would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from the Lord, whether we're here on earth or we're with him in heaven. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In other words, there's gonna be a judgment day coming. There'll be a day when you will be judged by the God of the universe, and that's gonna dictate what it looks like for you after death. Now, here's what we know just from this Corinthians passage. If or when the earth is destroyed, heaven awaits Christians. And I say if because it's really when, right? When the earth is destroyed, heaven awaits those who claim Christ. When we get to heaven, here's what we know at death, we will not carry the burdens of this world. I mean, could you imagine that just for a moment? <sighs> just not having to carry the burdens of this world. Some days I long for heaven. We learn this, when our soul leaves our body, what we learn from this text is we are immediately in the presence of God. We learn that the spirit we receive at our salvation guarantees us full admission into heaven. So these are really important theological truths that Christianity teaches, that scripture teaches, and Christians believe. And it's important because some of us, uh, maybe, you know, depending on your background, maybe you had a Catholic background. We've got a lot of folks who have at some level either family members or themselves been in the Catholic church. And you've heard of this teaching called purgatory, right? Pur purgatory is the Catholic belief that when you die, you are not fully sanctified, so you must remain basically in a spiritual waiting room until you're purified enough to enter heaven. And the teaching comes from the Catholic collection of books called the Maccabees. Now, the Maccabees in the Catholic Church are not our, our, our canonized Old Testament, New Testament. They're, they, they stick them in between the Old and the New Testament. And it implies that there is still work for you to do after your salvation, and our understanding of scripture is that the complete work of Christ has already been done. So to be away from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. So if that's something that you grew up uh, 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 under the teaching of, I just want, I wanna challenge you this morning that we read from scripture that once we die, once this body fails, we are in God's presence. Now, there's a, you, you can read a lot of stuff. We're not gonna talk about purgatory for a long time this morning. Like, thank you. But there's a lot of stuff surrounding why this teaching came up in the Catholic Church. I'm just telling you, 
If you believe that there is still work beyond the cross and, and the righteousness of Christ dying and raising the life, if you believe there's still work to be done before you're gonna get into heaven, you, you, you haven't read scripture well. Hebrews 10 puts it this way. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, here's what it says, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So when Jesus did what he did, when he died on the cross, his blood was shed, that sacrifice, it says, that sacrifice was enough. It was enough to forgive all of your sins, past, present, and future. And what scripture teaches us is that when forgiveness is given, there's no longer a need for more sacrifice. We believe that Jesus' sacrifice covers it all. So what we read in scripture is that to be absent from the body is when judgment takes place. That's when you stand before God. And the Christian will, will stand before the Lord. The, the non-Christian will stand before the Lord. When you die, you will face the creator of the universe. And 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that if you have made Jesus your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God will guarantee your admittance. In other words, you don't have to sit there and apologize until you get in, or you don't have to sit there and look at, at, at the Lord and go, was I good enough? Because that's not what we read. We read that the spirit of God in you, you're not good enough. That's why Jesus died for you. And that's why he died for me. So the, the, there's the answer. So you're not good enough. So the spirit of God in us is what guarantees our admittance. How cool is that? So for those who have not submitted their lives to Christ, scripture tells us that we'll be unable to enter the presence of God. We'll be separated from him eternally. So then is this heaven that we're waiting for, what's it look like? What about heaven? So if we know once we die here on earth, we're immediately judged in the presence of God, right? What, what is this whole heaven thing? One of the best books I've read on this is a book by Randy Alcorn. And it's a book, you're gonna love the title. It's called Heaven. Super creative. Uh, but, but if this is something you've just been wrestling with, maybe, maybe you even uh, have somebody close to you that died recently and you're like, man, I just wanna know more about heaven. Man, I don't have a ton of time today because we're confined. This book has such good info and a lot of what even I wanna share with you today is from my reading of the book. And so uh, if, if you have that desire, man, I just wanna encourage you to get it. But I think it's important when we talk about heaven to know what we're talking about. So if you've ever heard someone teach on heaven from scripture, th this, this will maybe come together. If you haven't heard somebody teach on heaven, this is vital for you to understand what you believe if you're a Christ follower. So we talk about heaven usually as a single place or a location, but, but actually that is not what scripture does. Scripture ties heaven to the dwelling of God. So, so God's dwelling is heaven. We, we kind of think of it again as a geographical place and certainly wherever God is, is gonna be a location, but we often think of it as a location in and of itself. So in talking about the location of heaven, here's what we know, this is, this is good. There is a present heaven and an eternal heaven. Now let me explain, right? There's a present heaven and an eternal heaven. So when we talk about the location of the present heaven, we're talking about heaven before Jesus returns heaven presently, the current one. And Philippians 1, tells us this, that the present heaven is far better than earth. Now I get some of the stuff you're gonna be like, well, I, I would hope so, right? But, but we, we gotta lay the foundation. The present heaven, however, isn't our eternal heaven. Now hear me out. The eternal heaven will come when Jesus returns. Now, in his book, uh, Alcorn shares this illustration, and I love this illustration. And, and, and again, no illustration's gonna do heaven justice, right? But we're gonna try to, to bring this into our finite minds. He says this, he says, suppose you live in a homeless shelter in Miami, and one day you inherit this beautiful house. I mean, it is fully furnished, gorgeous hillside overlooking Santa Barbara, California, right? And, and with the home comes a wonderful job, doing something you've always wanted to do. Not only that, but you'll be near, near your family and, and, and all those who moved away from Miami years ago, you, you'll get to be with them. And on your flight to, to Santa Barbara, you'll change planes in Dallas, all right? You'll spend the afternoon in Dallas. And some other family members who you haven't seen in years will, will meet you at the, at the Dallas airport and they'll board the plane with you to Santa Barbara. <laughs> and you look forward to seeing them. Now, when... 
The Miami ticket agent asks you, where are you headed? Would you say Dallas? No. You would say Santa Barbara, right? Because that's your final destination. If you mention Dallas at all, you would say, I'm going to Santa Barbara by the way of Dallas, right? So when you talk to your friends in Miami about where you're gonna live, would you focus on Dallas? No, you might not even mention Dallas, even though you will be a Dallas dweller for a few hours, right? He says, even if you spent a week in Dallas, it wouldn't be your focus. Dallas is just a stop along the way. Your true destination, your new permanent home is Santa Barbara. Dallas, however, is a paradise compared to the homeless shelter in Miami. And yet it's not the final destination because the final destination is still to come. It's a spiritual dimension that is not visible to us. It's unseen to the physical world. Now, the best way uh, to, to, to get back in this is by reading scripture. What scripture tell us about this? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 16 says this. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, arch, archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So what do we know, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter five, about this present heaven, right? Revelation six gives us some insight. This is what we know about heaven currently. We know that those in heaven will be remembered for their lives on earth. We know that they raise their voices individually and collectively. We read about that in verse 10. They asked God to intervene on their behalf. Uh, we read that they know what's happening on earth, those who are in the present heaven. We read that they remember their lives on earth. We read that they are distinct individuals. They're not just merged into this single identity, but they're distinct individuals and that they live in expectation of the eternal heaven. There is time and place, I mean, time in the present heaven. There's time. It says they understand that, 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 that Jesus is waiting for his return, and they feel that. They still, according to verse 11, they still feel connected to their families on earth. It talks about their brothers and sisters. So they still feel connected to their families. So, so there's actually a lot we can know about the present heaven. So what about after Jesus returns, right? That's what Revelation 19 was talking about. That's when the eternal heaven is ushered in and the spiritual realm and the physical realm are combined. Well, most of John's writings talk about the eternal heaven, the city of God, the final destination, Santa Barbara, if you will. I know calling California heaven is a bit of a stretch, but work with me. What we know is that God's children are destined for a resurrected life on a resurrected earth. That's what scripture teaches us. In fact, I wanna read Revelation 21. This is what it says. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Now just to be, just to be clear, when John says this, this is him talking about what is to come. He is receiving a vision from the Lord. He's, a, he's actually seeing this, right? He said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, he calls it, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautiful, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his God and God himself, uh, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So again, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He'll wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. 
He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for, those words, for, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The, to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. This is cool. This is what we're waiting for. This is the eternal city. Not just the present heaven, but the eternal heaven. So, so maybe if, if you wanted to put another twist to the flying to Dallas analogy, it might be more precise to imagine leaving the homeless shelter in Miami, flying to an intermediate location in Dallas, and then turning around and going back to your place of origin, which has been completely renovated, a new Miami. That might be a better way to view this. And I don't know what your, your view of the eternal heaven, this city at Jesus' return that will, will descend from heaven. I don't know what your view is, but Revelation 21 tells us pretty clearly. It tells us it's called the new Jerusalem or the city of God, and that it's a physical city, not just a spiritual realm, that it descends into the physical, and it comes down out of heaven. We read that. That it's prepared, that, that, that God's been working on it, I, I, I've read some commentators say that in the, in the present heaven, wouldn't it be cool if those who are currently in the present heaven are, are able to, to witness or view the work that's being done on the eternal city? It's God's dwelling among men, man is what we read. It's for the victorious. That There's no day or night because the sun and the moon aren't needed. It says that the glory of God literally just radiates from the city. In fact, it's the ultimate version of the Old Testament Jewish temple. We actually read the dimensions of the city and it gives the gates of the city and it's like the, the, the temple, the perfect temple has been brought to earth. It contains the river of life and the tree of life. Now, what, what do you know about uh, the, the river of life and the tree of life? Well, there is this beautiful picture of the Garden of Eden in Genesis being restored in the city of God. The Garden of Eden is brought back to what it was meant to be. And the infrastructure is made of transparent gold. It says the, the streets are gold, but, but it's so pure that it's, it's trans, almost like a transparent gold. And it says we'll have bodies and spirits. So, so whatever you believe, understand this, you don't become angels. In fact, uh, what we learn in scripture is that the angels, it says, was made a little lower than us. Like hu humanity, human beings, don't just become angels when they die. I like this quote by Alcorn. He says, unlike God and the angels who are in essence spirits, human beings are by nature both spiritual and physical. In other words, God did not create Adam as a spirit and then place it inside a body. Rather, he first created a body and then Genesis tells us that he breathed his spirit into that. There never was a moment when a human being existed without a body, right? That's what makes us human. In fact, uh, if you get into the science of it, I love this because studies reveal that uh, there's this intimate connection between the body and what has historically been referred to as the soul, which includes the mind and the emotions and the will and the intentionality and the capacity to worship. It appears that we are not just essentially spirits who inhabit bodies, but we are essentially as much physical as we are spiritual, and we cannot be fully human without the spirit and the body. So while the present heaven exists in the spiritual realm, the city of God at the return of Jesus is both physical and spiritual, right? It comes down from heaven. So what's this mean? Well, it means what we do while we're waiting matters. It means what we do while we're waiting matters. You see, the way you wait is dependent on what you're waiting for. And I, I believe this, like what we read in scripture of the present heaven is that those who have gone before us right now that are waiting for the eternal heaven, that they are in heaven pleading before the Lord, worshiping before the Lord, and they're able to still, that there's this connection with what's happening down here on earth, and they're still cheering, going, hey, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, right? Hanging in the waiting room certainly feels difficult at times. But when you know what you're waiting for, it changes the way you wait. I mean, listen to me. Uh, waiting in a waiting room for a colonoscopy is not a waiting room of joy, right? <laughs> 
The way you wait depends on what you're waiting for. Some of us, we have a struggle waiting right now because we aren't certain what eternity looks like. We haven't given our life to Christ. But if you're in a waiting room in which the other side of the door (laughs) holds the answer to the brokenness and the humanity of this world, you tend to wait with an unbelievable expectation. And if the way you wait is dependent on what you're waiting for, y'all, the way we wait matters. It does. The way you live this life matters. Knowing that the dinner that is prepared for those who trust in Jesus, that this dinner, this banquet is being readied, it seems important that we understand not just what we're waiting for, but that we have to have purpose in this waiting. Why? Because the plan wasn't that you show up to this feast alone. That wasn't the goal. The plan is that we proclaim this glorious supper and we proclaim that there is a banquet coming while we're waiting, right? We all have dads and moms and brothers and sisters, even spouses or kids who are in heaven proclaiming, if you knew what was on the other side of this waiting room, you would live different. God's getting ready to restore it all. And for those of you who come in today, you're like, man, I'm feeling the burden, the weight of this world. Jesus says, it's coming. It's coming, I'm gonna make it all new. Don't miss out on the wedding supper of the Lamb. Every week we we proclaim hope. We proclaim that there is a God that is planning a place. He's been preparing a room. It says that, that it's down to the detail that, that, that these, these, this city and, and the place in which we'll live and, and God will call his dwelling, that, that he's, he's made many rooms. He says, I, there's plenty of room. Come, like come. It's not full. And as we proclaim this hope, I want you to hear this, man. If you haven't made your reservation, today's the day. Today's the day. And and the way we, when we we built this room and when we decided this, uh, the way this room was gonna lay out, we, we put barn doors over here that open into an area that's got soft seating, couches, and just an area that feels comfortable to talk in. And we put a, a sign. Can you guys light that sign up? I don't know if I can just talk like that and you guys light a sign. Look at that. I honestly don't have that much power. I'm just throwing that out there. They're very good. But, but we put hope is here because what we know is what's on the other side of the door, right, is good. It's good. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? If you don't know Jesus, it's time. And if you're here today and you know Jesus, listen to me. Those who know Jesus, we wait differently. We wait with a hope. And you may be discouraged. You may feel burdened. You you may have come in and just thought, man, I just, there's a lot going on right now. I want you to hear this. We wait with victory. And we pursue each day and each relationship and each moment with victory. Why? Because we got a lot of folks who've gone on before us and they're going, man, if you knew what was on the other side of this, this waiting room, I'm telling you, you'd live different. You'd live different. Let me pray for us. God, you're good. Man, the fact that you would design a place that's beyond our imagination is often hard to even fathom. But it's what makes you so incredible that you have have a plan down to the, the inches of each wall of what this eternal heaven, this city of God is going to look like. And the fact that that there is a river that runs through this city that no one will ever find their soul thirsty again, that a tree will give life, the, the fact that you will wipe away every tear and the fact that we, we will see the brokenness of this world restored to the way you created it to be. Oh, Father, it causes us to wanna to wait different. And I pray that you would press on those today who have been waiting to make you their Lord and Savior, that today's the day. Today is the day of salvation. They don't have to wonder anymore that the dinner supper of the Lamb is a supper in which Jesus is inviting everyone to. May we respond faithfully.
We love you.